we actually can't treat our our allies as if they're um, protectorates, uh, something which I suspect we've done plenty of. And we're actually going to need their help, and they're going to need our help. And so we actually have to start treating each other more like equals, you know, which is maybe maybe more of a challenge than defeating our common adversaries, you know, treating each other more like equals. I'm being a little sarcastic because it is very tough to do business with the United States. On the other hand, there are episodes where other friendly countries uh, that we work with have, you know, sold sold the farm <laughs> to, to, to the wrong people. And I suppose now uh, it can be added that even the United States isn't behaving very well. <laughs> so we're we're all possibly in for some self-discipline here. But the thinking was that if we if we need to collaborate, as I think we do on very sensitive high tech defense related projects, uh, this, the, the various systems, uh, including some favorites like ITAR, you know, might have to be relaxed just a little. But perhaps in exchange, all of us, including maybe even the United States, need to tighten up what we give away to the countries we might have to go to war with. So that was the simple idea. And now we're going to listen to experts who actually you know, know more, a lot more uh, than what I could relay. Uh, we have two highly qualified speakers, and then we're going to open it up for uh, what, looking at the audience, is an extremely qualified group of people to add to our knowledge and uh, refine whatever has been said. Now, um, Jim Schaff is uh, sort of a preeminent uh, Asian expert, I suppose. We call him perhaps an Asian hand. Is, is that the, the, uh, the right? Does anyone ever called you an Asian hand? I've been called worse, but I've been called, uh, yeah, Japan hand. Uh, Japan hand, there you go, that onomatopoeo, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Well, okay. Chrysanthemum club, you know? Well, no, that's a little, if you know a lot of history, that's not so good. So, all right. Um, more to the point, he's worked on the issues of the U.S.-Japan alliance extensively and East Asia policy, both in the Gov, uh, which counts a lot in my book, the Office of Secretary of Defense, and at uh, Carnegie, and now at uh, Saskatchewan uh, Peace Foundation, which is sort of roughly the Council on Foreign Relations for Japan. Um, and he's focused on these questions of military collaboration. I thought we'd open with him. I, I can introduce Bill uh, Greenwald, um, but why don't we use the, the, uh, the expectation and, and the desire to hear that as a as a uh, incentive for Jim to be immensely consent, uh, concise. <laughs> How's that? How many minutes did I encourage you to go? Uh, I think I was told twelve, but I can go to closer to ten. Um, well, I think you should you know, do the full full twelve uh, with with no worries at all. Okay. Well, we'll see. Oh. We'll see how it goes. But uh, okay. thank you very much. Henry, I appreciate okay. it. Uh, it's great to be with you and and with all of you on on this call today. Um, a lot of friends and and a lot of people I admire uh, on this call. So, um, you know, th this topic you can look at it relatively broadly, and I think there's also a very detailed legal aspect to this discussion, uh, which perhaps we can get into to some extent. But I thought I would play to my strengths, focus on the U.S.-Japan relationship, and approach it from a broader uh, technology security perspective. And within the alliance, you know, U.S.-Japan science technology collaboration has uh, obviously a very long history, starting back in the 1960s with work on natural resources, medical sciences, and it's expanded to nearly every field you can imagine, including outer space and um, uh, uh, high energy physics. Uh, the political and foreign policy backdrop or context for this collaboration has evolved. Um, ebbing and flowing in terms of perceived priority and opportunity and outright competition for a while in the 80s and 90s. 
But I think it's fair to say that we have never seen the kind of bilateral alignment that exists today in terms of policymaker interest and a widely perceived need for foreign technology collaboration, specific areas of research focus, and the overall goals of that collaboration. And I would pick three uh, overall goals. One is mitigating climate change or its impact. Two is being able to control pandemics. Um, and three is staying ahead of China in a wide range of critical technologies and scientific discovery. And it's this last objective that I think is the most pertinent in a bilateral context because more open multilateral engagement is available for the first two. Uh, but succeeding in this objective gets right to the heart of today's topic. And I think there's a, a, a variety of things that, that we probably need to do and that Japan in particular needs to do. So if we can go to the first slide, uh, please. This is you know, just the, the general case for US science and technology collaboration. Uh, uh, the case for our collaboration with Tokyo, I think is clear. Uh, Japan is third largest investor in R&D behind the United States and China. Japanese companies fund more R&D in the United States than any other country's firms. Uh, Japan is also the third most prolific patent, patent filer behind China and the United States. So pooling resources, data, and talent, I think would clearly benefit both allies. The question is how to do this in light of new geopolitical realities and the pace of technological change. The government side of things, I think, is easier to control, relatively speaking but the private sector is more important. So if we can go to the next slide, please. This is a few years out of date, but the, um, the trends are exactly the same, if not um, greater today than they were a couple of years ago. Private companies are the largest funders of R&D in both countries. Um, and you can see how the business side of R&D funding just in the United States on the left-hand side has uh, greatly exceeded what the federal government uh, presents. And then on the right-hand side, uh, are some individual companies uh, and their numbers. Those numbers are already, um, it's just a couple of years old, but, but um, the numbers are actually about double than what they were back in 2018. Um, this is even more the case in Japan. Uh, and I would note that non-defense companies are the biggest investors. Um, Amazon spent about $43 billion in R&D in 2020, Alphabet almost 28 billion, Microsoft and Apple, 19 billion each, Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, et cetera. That's not where the, uh, where the money is, is coming from in terms of uh, R&D today. Uh, the next slide, please. In terms of comparing, to give a feel for how research is funded and conducted in Japan compared to the United States, uh, these two flow charts uh, are not necessarily the same scale, but you can see the percentages there. Uh, but I show it to highlight a couple of things. Um, one is to show the relatively smaller role that Japanese government funding plays in the national picture compared to the United States. Another is how little Japanese government research funding goes to the business sector directly um, compared to us. Uh, and also international contributions or rest of world, uh, that brown, um, I think it's the brown category. Nope, that's the blue, the light blue category on the US side is pretty much non-existent uh, on the Japan side. Um, but there is a concerted effort underway in Japan uh, to expand the international component of scientific endeavors. And the Japan Science and Technology Agency, for example, is putting relatively small amounts of money right now behind this about 20 million, maybe 40 million uh, behind an initiative with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories using Lawrence Livermore is kind of a hub by which they can then interact and engage in other research projects with other U.S. national labs. Um, of course, we had the great uh, kind of fusion uh, uh, revelation uh, recently from Lawrence Livermore. So there's a lot of interesting work uh, going on there. Um, so this effort by Japan to, to really engage and put money behind international uh, R&D, uh, also in the semiconductor sector and elsewhere, uh, presents an opportunity. But there are a wide range of technology and information security challenges that need to be overcome in order to reach our potential. Um, and I'll list out a, a couple of examples. Um, some research I did a, a little while back interviewing companies uh, on, on their Japanese companies on their research 
activities here in the United States in partnership with universities, with other companies, uh, even with US government contracts. Um, there are a lot of challenges in terms of how the US manages export control research within these consortiums. So it's often very unclear whether or not certain information can be shared between, for example, and I'm not, uh, uh, well, uh, company A in Japan, technology company A, whether it's Hitachi or NEC or uh, NTT. Uh, there was one example, one of those companies could not send back some of the raw data back to Tokyo, who was with other researchers who were working on the same topic in kind of a collaborative way, because they weren't sure if that information was um, uh, export controlled or not. It was, it was part of a quantum uh, computing project that was going on. The process of inquiring, so they go to the compliance department and then the, the process of, of inquiring uh, whether or not that was, uh, they could transfer that, took at least three months to get an answer back from Commerce whether or not um, they, they needed to go through that process of, 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 of seeking an export license just to send that broad data back. So there's certainly areas um, that we can improve and clarify what types of projects or kind of pre-approve certain projects um, to, to facilitate collaboration is, is one example. Um, another example, this was a DOE funded project out um, for AI enabled uh, smart grid technology and electrical power distribution, where they were using the actual data of a massive California electric utility, uh, the customer data to help drive these models. Um, but all of that data, because it was private, company, corporate, personal data was um, CUI, was controlled on classified information and had all kinds of certain restrictions in terms of how that data was stored and what servers and who had access. So the Japanese company that was a partner originally in that consortium had to back out because the cost of changing the way that their computer systems managed that uh, data was cost prohibitive and pulled them out of that situation. Um, so harmonizing the way uh, we manage and share data and protect data is, is another area. Um, there's another example of the Defense Trade Advisory Board uh, trying to identify certain key countries, partner countries that could go kind of on a white list and, a, and a facilitate uh, uh, transactions or sales of, of uh, added on parts, components, service after certain initial sales were made to a foreign partner. They wanted to add Japan to that list. Um, but the deemed export hiring problem uh, in Japan, the way they treat residents versus nationalities on, on managing deemed exports and who has access to what kind of information was ultimately deemed um, not sufficiently rigorous uh, by the Defense Trade Advisory Board. So they, they added NATO countries and, um, and, and Australia, I believe, to, to this list, but not Japan. Um, so. Uh, Another area uh, in Japan, generally speaking, and I'll talk to this in my final slide, uh, Japan has made some improvements in its uh, clearance system, uh, its handling of information security, certainly on the defense side in particular, but in the private sector side, it's it's nowhere near what, what it is in the United States uh, today, and it's not viewed as sufficiently compatible. Um, the export control, arena, um, which others on this call can go into in more detail. Uh, my understanding is, is METI and the Japanese government does not have the same kind of discretion or ability um, without taking relatively drastic interpretations of how to apply their law. Uh, they don't have the same kind of flexibility or ability to target particular end users um, in China or particular end uses that are not necessarily connected to WMD. Um, so they have a lot less flexibility uh, on that front as well. So the last slide, if we can go to that, is something I had from from before, and then I added a couple of things to it. Um, you know, what kinds of recommendations are there for Japan to to strengthen uh, its its information security, and where we could take steps to harmonize um, our systems and facilitate uh, uh, joint collaborative R and D projects? private sector uh, uh, collaborations as well. Number one would be clarifying the sole designated authority in Japan for information security. Uh, we have the National Disclosure Policy Committee, uh, 
uh, the NDPC. Um, Japan spreads it out among its, its ministry base. There is no kind of one authority uh, for how that is handled. Um, there are ways that they, they could, could, could manage that, I think, that would not require any kind of new legislation necessarily. Um, security clearances for the private sector uh, and researchers. Uh, right now, they can't extend those clearances to uh, secure government security clearances to people who are not working on uh, specific defense programs. Uh, so the whole dual use arena is is a, is a murky area and, and difficult for Japan to, to, to play in. Um, the deemed export coverage that I mentioned before, export controlled research uh, is another area that, uh, that Japan could improve, developing a classified quarter dispute resolution system, uh, building a cadre of professionals within the government, like the GS0080 uh, class, where you can have an entire career um, in the government focused on information technology security. Uh, that's not currently possible in Japan. Developing centers of excellence uh, for both research and technology security. So having uh, research centers like IST, NIMS, RICN, which are uh, preeminent um, uh, venues, but do not structure themselves or they're not currently prepared to, to divide up their work in kind of unclassified and either controlled, more controlled or more classified uh, work. Um, it's hard to do that now in the universities based on, on the politics in Japan on dual use and military technology or possible military applications. Uh, but, um, but if you did it within these government centers and invested in uh, kind of some of the hardware changes of how uh, the, the work is managed and who has access to what parts of the building, uh, you could bring in the best researchers from around the country and just give them a different contract. They could still be based at a university, uh, but but come do work at ICE or NIMS. Um, and then more importantly, be a peer-to-peer -peer collaborator with one of the U.S. Um, national labs um, on particular areas of, of, uh, of shared interest and, and expertise. Um, and then also improving the way we in gather intelligence on supply chains, corporate linkages in China, um, we, we're each touching this elephant at different parts and places, um, and I think we have different networks that could we could benefit from uh, uh, getting our arms around uh, how uh, China is is trying to to get around some of the different uh, roadblocks and and uh, obstacles we're we're looking to put in their way. Um, so that's uh, kind of my overall uh, take on the. Uh, technology security landscape within the Alliance and happy to move on to the next area of the topic. You're, you're muted. Henry. We take in uh, the next presentation and then open it up. Uh, that was excellent. I, uh, those, those pictures are worth more, more than a thousand words for sure. Um, and very, very helpful. So, uh, the next speaker is uh, Bill Greenwald, who is uh, a rare animal, I think, by looking at his resume. Uh, he can claim to have worked in industry. Well, not he can claim. He has worked in industry uh, with uh, aerospace industries. He's worked on the Hill in various committees. He's He's worked in the government and he's reached his highest life form. And now uh, he is in a nonprofit. <laughs> it's amazing what that evolution. How that goes. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm serious, but, <laughs> but in any case, well, I think what's useful is that uh, uh, Bill has been on various sides of the counters. And I think uh, if I would wish for anything, uh, in the public service sector is that uh, um, the uh, opportunity to, to move in those four quarters needs to be augmented and, and encouraged. I think, uh, just a personal comment, I think the ethics terrorists have made it almost impossible and it's it's hobbled the, the level of quality uh, public service that otherwise would be available. So uh, he snuck in underneath the radar system. Let's see what he comes up with next. 
Well, well, well thank you, Henry. And uh, yeah, I, I suffered a lot on, on all those jobs you, uh, you, you talked about. So I, I'm much enjoying the, the think tank world, uh, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out a, a number of different points, and maybe some of them will, will generate questions and, 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 and so on. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but uh, you know you, you can just cut me off, and we'll, we can go to a few other things. But uh, you know the, the you know the first point I want to say is you know yes I, I agree in general with the underlying policy objectives that we're here to try to discuss. I mean it makes a lot of sense. We should be working with our allies, and they the second thing is they shouldn't be conduits of technology to our enemies. I mean you know obviously the devil's in the details trying to figure out how to do that. Um, Next, I've been working this issue for the last few months, um, primarily in the under the auspices of looking at uh, the you know potential future of AUKUS, and uh, I hope to do a report here in the, in the coming months. But so far, what I'm finding is that we're pretty much at the precipice of another dismal policy failure that rests on the inability of the U.S. to reform its ITAR system, and that we can go back to. The, you know, how the, uh, the Canadian ITAR exemption was undermined, how the Australian UK defense treaties came to nothing, and basically how something I was, uh, you know, worked with uh, the NTIB expansion has come to, to naught as well. Um, and we can talk about all the reasons why, if, if, if anybody wants to go, go into that. Um, I, but I, there's something I do want to kind of dig into because I think the premise of, of, of the, the topic is one that we probably want to take a look at and, 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 and be a little more nuanced because uh, it, it implies a, uh, a level of technological superiority on behalf of the United States that frankly may not exist anymore in many areas. And kind of instead of this quid pro quo, which I can see the State Department and policymakers thinking, well, gosh, if we give these allies some of our technology, which is, you know, better than anyone else in the world, they need to figure out a way to, to uh, replicate what we do and replicate this uh, vast, uh, complicated bureaucratic system. And maybe we should think about something different, and maybe there's a more compelling case out there to stop keeping us from shooting ourselves in the foot and then making sure that our allies do the same. So I want, I want to kind of step back for, for, a, for a bit because this issue also, ex export control reform, tech transfer reform, so on, is very similar uh, and, and it's just one pillar of a defense management system that really no longer aligns with U.S. interests. And uh, the same factors that are undermining the effectiveness of the defense acquisition system, the budgeting system, the oversight system, the requirement system, which I wrote uh, extensively with uh, in a Hudson paper, for those of you who might be interested, with, with Dan Pat uh, a few years ago, those are playing out in the defense security management system, which includes tech transfer and, and export control uh, uh, regimes. And I also have to say that for those who might be interested in further uh, readings on this, uh, I did a report on the Atlantic Council in 2017 on export control processes in, in light of the, the NTIB expansion. And those, those findings are, are, are equally as valid today. The reality is not much has changed. So as we look at this, this is a bigger issue than export controls. It's an issue regarding uh, how we incentivize and are proactive in uh, encouraging de future defense innovation rather than kind of the way our system and our management systems and our acquisition system and our export control system are predicated on a reactive view of the world of uh, defense technology superiority by the, by the U.S., uh, of technologies that we need to control, protect, and build on that were primarily created between the 1940s and 1970s. And we have to kind of look at that. That's, that's the golden age of, of U.S. defense uh, uh, innovation. So um, I, I was called back um, in 2015 to work on the Senate Armed Service Committee by Senator John McCain. And he was concerned 2014 was a, was a, was a key point for him with the militarization of, of the South China Sea, the annexation of Crimea, it became obvious that we were facing a different global security situation. 
and that our defense innovation system had to be radically reworked around speed and agility. Uh, and it also became obvious that we needed scale. If we were going to compete against a country with four times our population, with many, many more times the STEM talent, uh, we needed to bulk up. And uh, the only way to get the, the, the level of uh, engineering talent working on defense priorities was to work with our allies. And so defense cooperation was a big deal, but also was focusing on time to innovation. And as we all know, or if anybody who's dealt with the export control process, it is a process completely divorced from time. Uh, and, and, and that is something that, you know, it, it just adds time and over and over again to, to uh, factors, not just incentives within time in the bureaucratic process of approving things, but also in, in the companies and, and those who have to, to comply with it. Um, I, I came to Senator McCain uh, at that time. We created hundreds of new provisions, including the NTIV, and tried to push the departments and push the, the government into uh, whether it was uh, acquisition reform or export control reforms or whatever like that. And frankly, seven years later, I have to say, most of that has completely failed. We, we have the same system as we had then. And this failure, I think, is important to because we go through this discussion is to, is to say we in the United States learned the wrong lessons from the Cold War. We could not overcome a system that had been created over the last 50 or 60 years that is fixated on a linear, predictive, centralized command and control structure of a defense unique model of innovation where considerations about time to innovation and agility have been wiped clean from the system. Our export control and cooperative efforts with our allies suffer from the same fatal flaws and the underlying weaknesses that the rest of our innovation system suffers from is the same we've seen in export controls uh, and, and, and tech transfer and defense cooperation issues. We are a process and compliance oriented innovation system that wastes incredible amounts of money trying to get to where we want to go. And, but most importantly, it wastes time. When, our, when we don't have an adversary that's, that's moving fast, that's not a big deal. And that's one of the reasons why we think we have the systems we have. Well, the world has changed. And, and now we have to figure out how to, how to address that change. Um, so what is the process? What, what, what is our thinking? Why are we, you know, why are we kind of stuck in there? What needs to, to work and what variables should we be looking at? Uh, I think the first step is to kind of look at, um, you know, the prism that we in, in our American hubris of, of technological superiority have been operating since at least the Kennedy administration and maybe more so since the end of the Cold War. And we are looking at a, a static versus dynamic view of innovation where we control the keys of the kingdom and through all of our processes, we can maintain the static or try to maintain the static world of, of technologies developed in the 1940s and the 1970s. We have this view that American defense technology is so overwhelming in advance that the entire world can be divided into either our client states, as uh, Henry uh, uh, implied, uh, or potential enemies. And these allies or client states are believed to be dependent upon us and want to share in our, you know, our technological dominance. And we provide them, and this is the interesting thing, you know, words mean something. We provide them foreign military assistance, which is almost like, you know, public housing assistance. You know, they, they're not capable of developing these technologies by themselves. And we bestow this and bestow the greatness of our, of our technological superiority or engineering talent to these countries. Um, you know, and obviously we think of our potential enemies in the same way. They can't possibly do this. They're technologically inferior. They're just out there. They're gonna steal everything. And uh, so we need to endlessly protect this through process and so on to keep this static uh, innovation system in place. Well, you know, the world's changed. And, and this is all anachronistic. Uh, and, and it's changed in a number of ways. And, and if you look at, you know, where things are out there that, that, that's problematic, is our defense industrial base is lagging today. It's incentivized to do what it's told, 
and not to pursue radical disruptive innovation unless it's paid to do so and it's all de-risk and so that you know there's no there's no risk involved here and i know some of the defense industry guys will yell and jump at me but but you know there, there's an in, the defense industry incentive to do certain things we've seen a rise of commercial tech unlike anything we've seen in in uh in, in our history and what's interesting is that most of the technology we really really want to focus on in the future for future disruptive innovation reside in the commercial sector big difference i mean i think dod is talking about 11 out of 14 of the technologies that will be important to them are in the commercial sector three aren't but even those three have a commercial tail there's doing things in the commercial marketplace that are that are that are worthwhile uh, um, and, and, and that's very interesting. Um, our export control compliance is not just an allied compliance issue. I mean, Silicon Valley and other uh, unique non-traditional companies face the same problems, the same incentives, and their, their goal on dealing with the U.S. government, dealing with knowledge-based transfer and, and not being ITARD is, is a huge, huge factor in what they do. And, and, and they've got to because it's, it, it, it affects their bottom line. And so this is a huge disincentive to getting the types of innovation we want in the Department of Defense. So far also, and this is the experience from uh, acquisition reforms, is globalization has probably helped our enemies more than it's helped us. Uh, our acquisition system is not open and not conducive to bringing in commercial technology. It's, it's uh, designed to deal with a, 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 a uh, a unique defense industrial base who understands the processes and so on. And that technology is leaking uh, and, and going abroad. And our, and our adversaries are using it, probably more so than we are. Um, we, um, we also have to think about something else that's been leaking out of the US and leaking out of the West, and that's production capabilities. And production capabilities are a variable in driving innovation and putting all our production facilities in China is probably not the smartest thing we've ever done. Uh, and, and, and no one really have focused on that. And that's going to be, be some, some, some real, real issues. Um, we have to figure out how to pull together the STEM talent of a larger base besides the United States. And that's going to mean how to cooperate, how to share. And ultimately when we get down to the point, ITAR restrictions on having discussions about military unique things are important. But there's another point here. Our allies are no longer clients. They're no longer technologically inferior. Whether it's in their commercial base, their military base, they have lots of interesting things and technologies and, and frankly, engineering talent that can, that can be brought to the fight. And we need to figure out how to use that. And, and stop treating them like clients and treating them as partners. And to do that requires a discussion of a trusted community. Who within our, both our countries can be trusted? What companies, what people? We need to agree on those type of things. And then we need to agree on what we're gonna do with whatever it is we, we create. And can, when, when can that move on? And that's incredibly complicated if it's commercial a little more easier when it's military unique. But, uh, but as, as we now know, since it's, there's a lot of commercial tail and everything, we need to figure that out up front. I think, uh, and, I'll, 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 and I'll stop here in a minute, we can talk about any, any of the, these issues, but I think the, the real thing to, to focus on is the way innovation is changing. We're not being nimble enough. We're not being agile enough. Um, our hope is the Chinese are get become better communists and become less agile and, and don't learn from, from what's out there. I wouldn't want to put my only bet on US national security based on that. We need to figure out and, 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 and factor in how to innovate better, how to incentivize that innovation. That means working with the commercial sector. That means working with our allies. That means bringing in technologies wherever we can and, and making it better either with US engineering, Australia engineering, UK engineering, Japanese engineering, however it is, and then bring that into the capabilities that our warfighters can use. So the problem we can probably define it into and as far as export control reform will go, who can we trust? 
Can we have negotiations on how to trust that? How do we address legacy US tech? Because we have lots of legacy US tech and how to use that is, is, is encumbered by lots and lots of problems. To me, that's probably not the most compelling, although it's, it's, it's important. But we really need to figure out how are we gonna deal with commercial derivatives? How are we gonna deal with emerging military tech that's primarily commercially based? And most, another key thing is how do we bring in and treat what is predominantly allied technology that may be better than ours or is better than ours? And how do we incentivize bringing that in and not because one engineer at Lockheed happened to, you know, to, to touch it, it becomes US ITAR controlled. And if I were frankly our allies, I'd run away from that in a heartbeat. And frankly, I think they are. So I will leave it there and uh, let's have a discussion. Was I provocative enough, Henry? Because I know you, you know, you you worry about me, you know, being a little too tame. Oh, you're on mute. I, I, I suspect you're better on the phone one on one than you are in public. But this uh, was I'll, pretty I'll, good. I'll, I'll turn it up a notch, okay? <laughs> well, that was pretty good. So uh, the way we'll do this is. Um, Try to uh, just put an entry in the uh, chat function, and if you you know need a two finger, raise your hand. How's that? Um, surely we should have something in the chat room here. Let's see here. We have here. I can't even see the chat. Uh, Mr. W Mr. Wolf, why don't you share your question that you put in the chat room? with everyone, and let's begin there. Mr. Wolf heard, heard, heard his name. Is he still with us? He might have been well, called away. Uh, I know how to deal with this, he said. I can read his question. Why don't I? All right, uh, Mr. Wolf said, uh, is the issue the complexity of the regulations and the need to figure them out or the existence of the regulations that require authorizations to share technology, software, and hardware between the U.S. and uh, uh, I guess it's Japan here. Um, if the latter, what is the perception of where uh, there are unnecessary or over controls between the U.S. and Japan? I think we can expand that to more than Japan. Yeah. I'll leave it to the Japan hand to start and I go. Yeah, yeah. Henry, I'll jump in just to, to get it going on this front because it, sure. you know, it's a good question. Um, and in the context of Japan, I would say it's it's more the latter. So it's it's about the authorizations. It's, it's more than just the complexity, although it's also um, the complexity that leads to delay in authorizations to, to some extent. Um, and I think where there are unnecessary or over controls, so you know the the Commerce Department just recently put out in the Federal Register their request for comment from the public on specific ideas of how to uh, uh, build the agenda for the uh, export control policy coordination between the U.S. and Japan. You know we have this JUSIP program between Commerce and METI, and they have various working groups on supply chains and one on export controls. And they're looking for specific ideas to to work on to to um, streamline things and improve things. And I was talking to a Japanese friend of mine, and you know, getting to to Bill's point, um, he's actually in the government, so he can't make a, a, a specific recommendation. But he wanted me or somebody here to make a recommendation: is certain allies should be ITAR and MTCR category one exempt, um, and uh, you know. There's a, a, a particular a, a potential idea, I think, um, or or some subset therein. The example I put out on export controlled research, I think, is another good example. That's just complexity that leads to delay. Um, four months to figure out whether something is or isn't export controlled research, or should they inquire about it? Um, going through compliance departments um, every time a question like this comes up, I think that just really stifles. 
of this kind of collaboration. And there are there, there should be ways to streamline that up front, either on a project by project basis on a long term running project or categorically to, to streamline that process with certain partners. Same would be true on uh, visa. Uh, letting researchers go back and forth relatively easily and stay for periods of time in each country without having to go through um, different types of, of uh, visa applications. There could be, uh, you know, a technology research uh, visa pool that, that that could could work on that front. And then uh, in areas of, of data sharing, that CUI example um, that I that I made, that's that's a complexity and a so I guess it's a combination of both in, in, in quick answer to, to Kevin's, but I think there are specific areas we can work on within the US system. Some of the other things I think need to be done by Japan or by other countries to bring themselves closer to harmony with us um, so that we have that confidence, but but that's a quick reaction. Yeah, let, let me, and, I, and I, I don't know if I wish Kevin was here because he could uh, uh, explain uh, in, in greater detail what I think are some of the really, you know, good reforms that Congress has, has put off at, under, under his uh, work there. Kind of designed to do that, designed to create some some uh, free free flowing uh, areas of, uh, of of approved licensees not having to go through the through through the process, and uh, I, I think that that's a really great start in in export control reforms that might be be able to be replicated uh, in 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 the ITAR world that could create you know. Open general licenses for certain things that, frankly, allow for the free flowing discussions and and transfer of, of of technology within certain categories. The the problem with that, and 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 I'm not sure. Like I say, I wish Kevin was here to 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 to. I'm help back. Me. I had to step up. Oh, for a moment. oh, terrific, terrific. Is 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 you know all that that concept I think really works very well. But in the ITAR world, and I don't know necessarily as much in the commerce world. Is ultimately, even though a license is 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 not necessary, the U.S. still controls the intellectual property or has the ability to, uh, you know, control that. Uh, uh, ultimately, the ITAR taint still exists. I don't know if there's equivalent commerce taint. Uh, I think there might be, but but in the ITAR world, that's that's a real problem. So if we do create open general licenses, if we do essentially have an ITAR free TAA zone free. Ultimately though, any transfer of US technology or transfer of US knowledge in that, unless we are specifically, you know, override a provision, you know, in, in the ITAR is going to leave that taint and therefore provide the incentives for companies and countries not to cooperate. And so I, I think that, that that's probably the big, the biggest problem I look at is knowledge transfer. It's the ability to pulling together engineers to work on that that doesn't lead to an ITAR taint. Because once you have an ITAR taint, once you have a taint that impacts the ability to do future work, there's no reason to do any work in the first place. And, and companies and countries will back away. Do you want me to answer your question? or Please, please, Kevin, I do. Yeah, so, I, do. I wanted to ramble there for a bit, but I wanted to give you yeah, time. No to think about um, it. I, I had to step out because my son actually started as an export compliance uh, grunt at a company and was calling about an end use question. So I gave him priority over you and answered his question about the uh, SDN and the end. I hope he pays you more than we do. Now he's, it's a really good job for college graduates. I, yeah. It's his first post college job. I highly recommend it. Anyway, so um, 124 8 uh, paragraph A5 in the ITAR says that. Uh, any defense article that's uh, produced or developed from US origin tech data or defense services is subject to the ITAR. And that's the ITAR taint uh, with respect to items produced from ITAR technology. Um, and, and then also in uh, new 12011, they've codified the longstanding concept that any um, defense article, no matter how small, any ITAR component uh, uh, inside of a foreign made item, whether commercial or military, is always subject to the AR unless carved out, such as in the satellite controls. And so those two concepts existed at the beginning of when I started in government in 2010, which were literally the foundation of the export control reform effort. And what we decided was that there are some things, uh, there are many things for which an ITAR taint is warranted, and there are many things for which a de minimis amount of 
US controlled content warrants controlling the foreign made item, but most things that was not the case. And so the whole reason for my existence for seven years in government was to move about 80 plus percent of all the parts, components, and other items that were less sensitive off of the USML and into the commerce regulation, still as military items, still with the China embargo, um, but to eliminate uh, those two jurisdictional taints and to create a much higher threshold uh, of control and to create a, uh, a very broad license exception, license exception STA for trade by and among between allies, including Australia, Japan, and the UK. Um, so what we made the decision of then uh, was to try to reduce the impact. Um, I just got back this fall from a six week travel through Canada, the UK and, and Australia of visiting defense contractors uh, on uh, it was work related. And I'm afraid that all of the benefit of my seven years in government have been lost uh, because when I would ask these various companies, how do you ensure compliance with the ITAR? They would say, oh, it's simple. We just design out all U.S. content, all U.S. components, and all U.S. persons. Yeah. And the way in which we're safe is that we just simply avoid anything that's American made. And that way we know we'll never get into trouble. <laughs> and, and sort of the whole point of joint development and joint production and joint operation and the policy objectives of, of the reform effort were lost in the psychology of the, of the day of the way to ensure the only, because of the complexity, the only way to ensure compliance and to avoid tainting a sovereign program is just to design out everything that's American. I realize that's an overstatement, but it, it nonetheless was a pretty pervasive response uh, that I got throughout. And, and Bill and I have spoken um, about the need to sort of leverage AUKUS or maybe the idea of leveraging AUKUS uh, to and, 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 and sort of the lessons learned from the treaty. And if it's good enough for Canada, why isn't it good enough for um, um, Australia and the UK and possibly Japan? Um, and, and so long as there were commitments and resources that exports from those countries would be treated the same way as if from the US, why are there still, even for remaining USML items, particularly with this joint concern regarding dealing with China and Russia, still so many barriers among friends, among parts and components largely. And, and I think that there's a real opportunity there and there's been a lot of you know, media coverage and some articles by others and congressmen and former ambassadors basically saying the same things lately. And I'm glad that you all are having this conference because um, uh, although nothing's been done in the past, I, uh, I still think it's important that we keep trying going forward and there's some wind at your back uh, on the idea. So anyway, that was a long winded answer to your question with a sort of a prospect for the future. No, and, and, and thanks, Kevin, because I, I really think, you know, the, the work that you did there really can form the basis of, of the framework if we decide how to expand it. And, and I think that's one, you know, really great, uh, uh, you know, p potential there is how, how to, you know, I mean, how do you remove the ITAR taint, incentivize this, and then have a discussion with our partner nations on how we control whatever comes out of this technological cooperation. And, and I, you know, obviously we're gonna have to have that discussion up front, but it's, it's, it's a different way than basically saying, you know, the, the, the five bureaucrats in the State Department are gonna control your life for the rest of, you know, your, your company's existence. They're very pleasant people though. I know they are very pleasant. All right, <laughs> let's go to Mr. McGovern. Yeah, hi, um, I'll just put my camera on so you can see me. Um, but uh, hi, Lachlan uh, from, oh, what's happening? There you go. Um, Lachlan from the, uh, the an embassy. Uh, Bill, I, I know you've been out in Australia and, and talking to our team back there. Um, and, you know, we had Osmian last week. We had the AUKUS Defence Ministers meeting last week, the first one. Um, and, you know, both of those public statements talk about in the broad, um, you know, breaking down barriers to tech transfer, information sharing. But, um, you know, as, as my question in the, in the chat sort of gets at, it seems like state is pretty resistant to this. Um, and I think Roy, my counterpart, or my colleague from the embassy asked almost the same question, like, what do we do about it, right? Like, how, how do we how do we get this mindset shift that you talked about, about we don't have the tech edge, we need to do things differently. Um, you know, look at something like Andrew, who just announced the, the ghost shark with them the other day, like the whole business model is setting up outside the US yeah. um, and then get around it. And we actually have something built already versus like as a UUV versus what we're seeing in, um, 
the, the standard sort of uh, process, even in a co-development or even an FMS site. Uh, so anyway, just interested in what we do about it, I guess. Thank you. No, uh, you know, I mean, obviously I've been, you know, this has been troubling me for a while and I go, go, you know, back from uh, agreeing with uh, um, uh, Kevin that, you know, these are really great people and they're just uh, misguided or, you know, or, or they're, you know, are they essentially a Russian agents here designed to destroy U.S. innovation and bring us our civilization down. And I, I go back and forth between, between the two. But I mean, you know, and all joking aside, I mean, they have a job to do. These are the rule sets. And frankly, you know, the, the, the blame I place on this is more at DOD's level. And that's why I spent so much time here discussing the nature of innovation. Because I don't think the Department of Defense has got their arms around the innovation framework that was so successful to them 50 to 70 years ago and what they do today. And, and, and because of that, you know, why would the State Department uh, look at it any other way that, oh my God, all these wonderful new technologies are being developed around the world. Globalization has created all sorts of uh, uh, new opportunities and risks. The commercial marketplace is kicking our butts. And, and you know, why would they, they think that? You know, I mean, they're, they're, you know, the state, the, the Department of Defense is, is operating and developing its weapon systems in a linear command and control communistic way. Uh, and oh, by the way, I hate to say most of our allies do the same thing and are replicating okay. our. I am our, looking our, at the watch. Okay. And there are four more questions. Okay. All right. I think all right. Both all right. the questions I, I, and the answers need to be more disciplined. So okay. Can... Culture change, culture change. All, all right. Move on. Okay. So. Uh, let's, uh, take 2 questions at a time and let's see if we can merve our answers. Um, Bruce, go ahead. Uh, lay out, try to turn it into a question, please. Okay. All right. Let's see. So, so <clears throat> I think of the classic example of extremely rapid innovation as the 100 fold reduction in warhead weight that occurred in Polaris. Um, and the reason that happened was when the notion was presented, Admiral Arleigh Burke on the spot decided to do it. And he had the power within the DOD to direct that to happen. Within a year, a submarine was cut in half to prepare for a warhead that had yet to be tested. Um, everything went forward so quickly that the weapon was deployed on station by October of 1960 to include the boats, the missiles, and the warhead. Would he go to jail today for doing something like that? And, and is it really realistic to think that you can kill a system, which is what I'm hearing, that prevents us from doing things like that today? Thank he you. He would absolutely go to jail today because he probably okay. would be funding, uh, spending, uh, you know, congressional appropriations inappropriately, blah, blah, blah. The, the issue we have, I mean, I, you know, no one's okay, ever- can we, can we get the question? I yeah. really am going to pull the pull on this. Okay. Let's get two questions, and I want you to think hard about how few words you can use okay. to answer okay. each of the questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's Bruce, uh, Mr. Birch. We do we even. Thanks, Henry. Yeah. I'm, yes. I'm here. <laughs> um, I think, as Lachlan said, my question was. Pretty closely aligned with his, so I thank uh, Bill for starting his response. And if he's able to, I wouldn't mind him indulging us by giving us a few more seconds on the answer. Thank you. Okay, now ready. <laughs> we got a half an hour, Henry. Come on. Oh, not not anymore. No, we're supposed to do this in about an hour. Oh no, you. Was, uh, okay, all right, all right. I got it. That's what I was told. Okay. Not ninety minutes. I was okay. getting instructed. That's the Hudson way, and I think they may know something we all should learn, which is less is best. Uh, okay, so. But the Hudson guy didn't show up, so maybe we can. No, I, I realize that, but his his ghost is right next to me. Okay, okay. So what 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 do we have in the way of concise answers to those those two questions, Jim? Well, Bill? I'll, give, uh, I'll give Bill a chance to to ponder a bit more, and this is not. You know, really, my area of expertise, but I did spend a little bit of time in 
the Pentagon and working the regional side with Japan and Korea. And Korea in particular was was not an easy partner um, on some of these defense trade issues. Um, I don't think we need to kill the system uh, personally because I don't think that's feasible. I don't think that's a that's a at least not as a as a first step. Um, so I do believe in working little obstacles piece by piece or or creating exempt areas or or programs or ways to um, identify priorities and and move more aggressively on those priorities. And maybe that is similar to the Polaris example in a way. And I think some of this we can do. It's not all how does it apply to defense technology? I mean, I think it's it's broader than that um, in terms of AI, quantum, uh, uh, high energy density, science, um, other areas where we have strengths and resources, whether it's lasers that exist here in the US and in Japan and in Europe, um, very expensive tools, supercomputers, et cetera, that if we um, focus those capabilities in disciplined ways with with data that can um, is shareable or you know we've stripped out some and worked out some of the privacy uh, issues and concerns you know I think there are pockets and opportunities to advance science and technology writ large then there's a separate question about how you get down to the uh, operationalizing or, or meeting the needs of the warfighter in particular ways and how you leverage that technology there is no reason to kill the underlying system it's 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 valid for how we're going to treat exports to the vast majority of countries. There is a need for a carve out, and 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 the same thing in acquisition. There's a need for an innovation carve out. We created it, uh, it, it with a number of authorities. There's a need for a defense cooperation carve out from export controls, and and uh, for our partner nations and how are we defined who those partner nations are and what's covered under that is something that's obviously subject to negotiation. So I think we should be looking at ways of moving around the system, leaving the system in place that many are comfortable for with and frankly many countries are not uh, uh, in the same situation as the UK, Australia, Canada and, and, and perhaps Japan. Uh, and maybe we could add Norway and a few other those to those as well. So, so I think that's that's the, the way to do the, is to look at the carve outs. As far as uh, I do want to say one thing to uh, to to uh, 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 on, on the, the the Arlie Burke example, just to be quickly take a look at uh, the report, the Hudson report, and look at decision time. It takes eight years now to start anything in the U.S. government, and, and, and as far as three years in the requirement system, three years in the budget system, two years in the contracting system to start something. Arlie Burke was able to compress that, and, and you've got to be looking at the budget requirements, acquisition, and contracting system, and how you can go around all those three to do what he did. I think it's still possible, but the big long pole that's in is now the appropriations process. Ms. Pekanen, I hope I didn't slaughter your name. Oh, you didn't, Sadia Pekanen. Thank you so much for these very thoughtful comments. I asked two very uh, quick questions. Um, I really appreciated your thoughtful remarks. I work on uh, space technology and policy, so really appreciate the uh, commercial and uh, uh, military challenges that are there in the production processes. I have two very quick questions. One is. Um, uh, I think both of you have sort of indicated how hard it is to uh, bring and convince allies on board. So could you comment or reflect on uh, the export uh, control campaign that the U.S. is on right now with respect to chips? Uh, where is that going? What is that uh, teaching us about the ability of the U.S. to sort of convince um, allies? The other question I have has to do with your assessment about threat perceptions. And do you think that our allies share the same threat perceptions uh, as um, about technology and uh, security with respect to China? That's all. Thank you. And we had uh, one two finger intervention by Mr. Countryman. Is it a comment or a question, Tom? It's a it's a quick comment, but I can wait. Okay. Well. We'll, we'll then 
perhaps go to Miss Miss uh, Jim. Pavich. You want to tackle that one, or you want me to go? Oh, no, no, hang on, Miss Pollitt. Uh, you had a question as well. Yeah, I, I think generally, Bill, you touched on it, and um, thank you, Kevin, for your input as well. I will say, from a process standpoint, particularly on the ITAR side, um, the the context by which transactions must be reviewed. And then once they get to state, the lengthy staffing and interagency review process that's tacked on to almost, again, every request that goes through state just seems uh, a bit onerous in general. So I'm, my question was around what space spaces you see in the other avenues for um, partnering and cooperation with our allies, treaties, INTIB, where we, the sheer number of reviews and then the number of reviewers in the process might be able to be minimized to make things go faster. I think it, the answer relies on a lot of the, um, the education and the coming to uh, an epiphany in State Department that time means something. And that, that's, a, that's a whole of government type of a, approach that time to innovation means something and all these processes we've created uh, to include, you know, the, the the time that you put in and everyone else puts in to do that, which right now is not factored in as a cost, is incredibly costly in our competition with China. And only until that happens will that that change. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to have we're going to be plotting through an incredible amount of bureaucratic morass uh, to achieve these objectives until the collective government as a whole figures out. For certain transactions, time matters. Right now, it doesn't. And uh, to Ms. Buchanan's uh, questions, I would uh, I would nominate uh, Kevin to maybe address the uh, export control question. What we've learned so far out of this, if he's if he's willing. But on the threat perception piece, my short answer would be. Um, no country is really a monolith necessarily. There's always going to be different. Uh, interests and, uh, but I would largely put Japan as yes, sharing uh, the threat perception that we have. Um, some industries a little bit different than others, but um, broad understanding from what I can tell uh, in Japan on, for example, the, the semiconductor export controls put on there and a, and a desire by Tokyo Electron to, to try to figure this out and not, they don't want to cross the picket line and they want to um, kind of manage it. The question is just, in, in detail how to do that. But in South Korea, I think generally it swings the other way. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a challenge in terms of then trying to build this coordination um, in a mini lateral framework. Okay. Uh, comment further to the questions? Well, I, I just think that, you know, wh wherever the threat's going, whatever, you know, the, the way the process goes, I think at some point our allies are going to make a clear and dedicated decision based on their national interests, whatever they deem those to be. And I think as Kevin's seeing, um, you know, even the reforms we put in place are not conducive enough to get these countries to want to engage in some of these reforms because we're frankly making it hard. And that's going to force them to work together, whether it's the UK and Japan, whether it's the, uh, uh, you know, whether it's, 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 it's an ITAR free solutions. I think we're going to see more and more of that and uh, more and more of specking US uh, content out until we get our act together and understand that it's better to all work together than to work separately on, on duplicative uh, uh, ventures. Okay. Tom, and maybe now is a good time to make your brief okay. comment. <clears throat> Thanks. It, it's been many years since I was involved in the government with ITAR and licensing and my ability to keep somewhat abreast of the issue is mainly thanks to Kevin Wolf. I appreciate it. So a comment that's more political than technical. Uh, every U.S. president, well, nearly every U.S. president has talked about the importance of multilateralism. My judgment is that the Biden administration believes in multilateralism rather than a 
dominant and client relationship more than any previous administration, that you have a president and a secretary of state who genuinely believe that cooperation with allies as near equals, if not perfect equals, is essential to our security. And I say that because the conclusion from it should be that the kind of reforms that have been discussed here, uh, which all make sense to me, uh, you're pushing on an open door with the administration. It is an extraordinarily heavy door, not least because of the constipation in Congress that makes legislation difficult to achieve, and certainly also because of established bureaucracies at state and DOD. But I think there is at least a prospect uh, of convincing this administration to get to hard work on this issue. Thanks. The, the only, th and I agree, uh, although I would also say that this administration is desire to put something out there in a policy perspective like AUKUS should have figured out pretty quickly and before they, they made this announcement that we need to deal with our submarine industrial base issues because it's probably not conducive to do that. And oh, by the way, ITAR is gonna be the thing that needs to reform to, you know, as well. And so maybe they're up in the big policy tent, they were thinking this is all great about defense cooperation and multilateralism. But if you don't address the plumbing of government, you're not gonna get there. And the plumbing of government has, has just waited out so many administrations. The export control reform efforts by administration after administration after administration has taken you know six years to finally get to, to fruition, or even in, and and and, and it's years and years to even knowledge that we have to do that. And I, I just hope the Biden administration can understand that this is a really compelling case they have to deal with now because they won't be able to reform it. Okay, we have um, Mr. Merrill. And uh, I think, well, we have one more comment by Mr. Goodwin. So, Mr. Merrill. Hey, everybody. I was, I think my luck with Kevin was saying about the same thing at about the same time. Very briefly, there's a dozen easy solutions. Kevin has identified the easiest one, which is just put eligible countries on the good list and put in some back channel. Uh, Verifications on that, and you're good to go. And looking forward to Kevin's further thoughts on that. The big risk to all of this is nobody has ever adopted any of these easy fixes, with the exception of Kevin and Tom's export control reform initiative, because nobody wants to create the loophole that somebody will let something out. Then have to explain that to the Hill. How did you let this technology escape? And how do you explain to the Department of Justice why you don't have the paperwork to prosecute for it? So doing it at the legislative level probably, hopefully, fixes all that. We know how to do this. We just don't do it. That's it. You know, that's a long, you know, historical problem, as you know. But um, I, I do think that the Hill uh, is not as much of a problem as it was in the past in the sense that you know, the, the forces have kind of realigned on this and there's just basically just the hill just doesn't have the knowledge that it used to uh, on this. That could be good or bad, but it's, uh, you know, that, that's that's definitely a problem. Um, but I do think that I think this thing has to be done by the executive branch because the hill doesn't have the knowledge anymore. And, and, and that's and that's incredibly problematic. So an executive order would be something I think. Better to put yeah, this in. Careful. Uh, the reason I mentioned 38J of the Arms Export Control Act is uh, that it, it really does limit the State Department in doing anything significant. And that's why the defense trade treaties were created, because it's the next section down that says, if other than Canada, if you want any country group exceptions, you have to go through the treaty and legislative process. And um, uh, and, and in order to go through with regulatory carve outs in the in the in the ITAR makes it for you know makes it very complicated, you know. Uh, Unless Congress gives states a little bit more flexibility um, uh, in country group exceptions uh, in general authorizations, and that's why the OGLs are so limited that state is published, and that's why we did the entire reform effort of moving things to commerce because we relied on 38F 
which allowed us to do what we wanted by merely notification to Congress rather than permission from Congress. And at the time in 2010, uh, many, sorry to be partisan here for a moment, Republican senators and congressmen said, whatever your idea is, even if it's my own idea being repeated back to me, I will block you. And, and that, was the, that was the way life was like, you know, in a Republican controlled Congress. And so we had to create a process where it was just notification only. Um, if, uh, you know, the better route even back then would have been to have amended 38J, but we, even for people that agreed with us, weren't going to give the Obama administration a victory. And I, I suspect the same will be the true as, you know, in the Biden team. Uh, but there are legislative solutions, by the way, that can sort of mimic uh, broad country group exceptions. Um, they're a little bit more complicated than necessary. But I guess my main theme from having done this for 30 years and having just done that six week tour of Australia, Canada, and the US, in addition to all the good ideas that are being discussed, it's got to be simple. It's got to be simple. I mean, I understand this because I've been doing it for 30 years and it's what people pay me for. But most people aren't, you know, we can't all be export control attorneys. And, um, and, and it's whatever we do, simplicity is the key. And, you know, the fault of the treaty is it's too complex. The fault of even many of the things that I did on STA is too many limitations and carve outs. And it has to be something that's easy for muggles to understand uh, in the close allies. And I think if we put it in the context of the objectives for AUKUS, if we put it in the context for, as this conference is about tightening things for, um, with respect to enemies, all the activity that's going on with respect to China and pull that, pull this effort into helping with that effort, I do think there's an opportunity to get something done. But the other problem is the manpower side. So I, you know, work 20 hours a day for seven years getting done what I got done along with dozens and dozens of other equally committed people in the administration. This administration, as terrific as the people are who are there, they are completely and utterly overwhelmed with dealing with Russia enforcement issues and, and all the China issues uh, right now. And to pick up something that would be as foundational of a change as what we're describing as good as it in, there just simply aren't the bodies there, let alone the leaders who understand all of this and can pull it together as a passionate vision. And so that's another limiter. And so if we were gonna do something to get it done, there would need to be some form of a coalition of people like us who could lay out what the plan is, do the homework for the administration, frankly, lobby the Hill uh, as well, and you know, uh, ethics rules permitting, and fire permitting, et cetera, and, and someone who's really passionate about this to work it and shop it around and sort of give yourself like a six year schedule because <laughs> uh, it'll take a long time to get all these things done. The problem with that, and, and I, I, I agree, there are, there, there are kept, you know, me members of Congress and senators with catcher's mitts waiting for the right thing to do. They're primarily, though, in the defense authorization committees. And what is going to happen and what has happened consistently in the past is those five, you know, State Department people have essentially gone to the Foreign Relations Committee, not through the administration or whatever, and, and told staff, this is just not, you know, don't do this. Okay. And they've undermined it. And, and frankly, staff is not going to go to their member and say, well, State Department just told me this is going to threaten national security and we're, you know, we're in. And, and, and that's a real problem because you won't get anything done legislatively. If, yeah. those, if the State Department is not reined in and is all talking in the same sheet of music and, and, and works with the, the members, that's the only way it can get done. Well, I'm going to end on an upbeat note. How's that? Well, I, I, mean, I, I mean, okay, let me finish. Okay. And then you, you know, if you have to say something, you can. It might be helpful to get a little market demand for whatever it is that's needed. Uh, embarrassment may still have some role in politics. I'm not sure. We may have exhausted our embarrassment and shame budget. <laughs> but it's quite entertaining to read about programs like, I, I'm, I'm not sure I know very much about this, the Ghost Shark Drone which was delivered to the Aussies in three months. It was a prototype. You know, if you had enough stories like that, pretty soon someone might hold a hearing going, why the hell are these things going on, but we can't do diddly squat. It, in other words, if you have more technology and it, it can be done quicker elsewhere, it can produce embarrassment to maybe ask, well, what are we doing? Why aren't we doing 
better and being able to keep up with what others are doing. I mean, I, if you take a look at the Turkish drone program, it's quite interesting. It really moves very quickly. And, uh, you know, it starts with shoddy product and then it gets better and better, but very quickly. Um, I suppose, you know, trying to get everything aligned, as you say, is it may not happen. But maybe AUKUS uh, should try to figure out how to embarrass the system. I mean, that should be a goal. The biggest embarrassment would be if our allies continue or start to produce new technologies among themselves and tell us to go pound sand. Yeah, well, that's the, maybe we need to have that happen. Because I don't think reasoning with the system is very effective. It's not. Yeah, We've it's been not. reasoning it for, for decades. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, there you go. It's a little, a little tidbit of hope. Um, but I think until people understand that our allies have something to offer that we really need, I don't know that the system will change. And I think that builds on what Bill said in a very great extent. Um, but, but, I, but they will offer on this on a positive thing. AUKUS provides the, the, the best opportunity I've seen for change in two decades. Okay, it, because it does have a compelling case, it does have member support, but historically, we've blown these chances. And so I think this, this is like our one last chance before our allies should just, uh, just ignore us and move another way. If we can't yeah. solve this for AUKUS, then yeah, we're hopeless. But I, I well, do hope we're okay. not hopeless. Well, all more reason to come to our next gathering, which will focus on AUKUS, space, and we'll get a report from someone outside of AUKUS, South Korea, which wants to do more with us in the space sector. Uh, we'll get back to you, It'll probably be sometime in January, more likely early February, but uh, we've already lined up uh, one presenter from Aerospace Corporation for that. Uh, on that note, happy holidays, and thank you all for coming.